Hi everyone, I'm Christy Stratus and I'm the author of Anatomy of a Darkened Heart and Brotherhood of Secrets. Both of those are psychological suspense and historical fiction, so a little bit of genre mixing there. And uh, I also have my own editing company, which you can find at proofpositivepro.com, as well as my own podcast, which is called Writer's Showcase, and you can find that one on Facebook, uh, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. Hi, I'm Jeremy Strozer, and I write historical flash fiction in a uh, personal way. So each story is a personal experience of an individual's experience in war. And my work is called Threads of the War. And I also have four books out and run a podcast called Threads of the War, which shares my work in an audio format. And all of my books you can get for free. So I'm simply giving it away to get the message out that war is a human experience. Okay, I'm Talina Winters, and I'm a multi-genre fiction writer, as well as a journalist and an editor, and um, some other things I'm going to leave off the list right now. Um, I have several uh, books out, and the series I'm currently working on is actually a mixed genre, um, young adult epic historical fantasy set in 1799. So um, yeah, it deals a lot with the Roma in England, as well as the Atlantic Strait slave trade and other things. Historical fiction is a literary genre in which the plot takes place in a setting located in the past. Although the term commonly is commonly used as a synonym for historical novel, it can also be applied to other types of narrative, including theater, opera, cinema, and television, as well as video games and graphic novels. An essential element of historical fiction is that it is set in the past and pays attention to the manners, social conditions, and other details of the period depicted. Authors also frequently choose to explore notable historical figures in these settings. No, I think uh, I thought it was pretty accurate myself. Um, I was glad that they said that you can choose to put in a historical figure because that's definitely the truth. And I think that sometimes it can be confusing whether historical fiction has to have an actual historical figure in it, and it doesn't. The point is really more that it's set in an actual historical time period that the um, characters, I think, as you said, Joe, are impacted by like the social norms back then, the etiquette, and that you get the details right. That's one of the most important parts. And I hear that from a lot of readers that you need to feel very transported into that time period. So I don't have too much of a problem with that definition, actually. All right. You know, it's funny, Christy, because I, I fully agree. There was nothing in there that I disagreed with. But I, I think in some cases uh, in my books that they're actually true stories, but since I can't interview the people as they're dead, it has to be fiction. And so it didn't bring up exactly what I'm trying to do, but it didn't disclude it either. So I feel good enough with it. <laughs> nice. That's a good that's a good point if you don't mind my saying that that's a good point that um, it doesn't necessarily have to have all the details of a historical figure that actually existed like you're saying you, you do have to embellish to some degree because not everyone you don't know everything about everyone in history so that's a great point. Exactly. How about for you Talina what did you think? I agree with the Wikipedia definition and just to expand on what the other two have said um, one thing that I had to decide um, and I think probably most authors have to decide this because we don't know what we don't know about a historical period and there is so much 
to know. And, you know, if you're only focusing on one little piece of one little place, it's probably a little easier to do the research, like my prequel novella with one little character in one little part of England in one specific time period. Whereas my whole novel series is quite epic and goes all over the world. And I discovered that there's like this major war that happened that really affected England. And it happened, I think, in 1800. I think it's called the War of the Oranges. And it really affected their politics. And I had to go, well, is this something that's going to affect my story or not? Like it could, or I could just pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> because it's, it's not relevant to my plot or my conflict, right? So you have to also realize you're telling a story and um, I think of uh, not long ago, I saw some someone commenting about Diana Gabaldon's work. And I don't know if I say her name right, but you know how I mean, she did an epic amount of research into the Outlander series. And I saw someone complaining about all the things she got wrong. Uh. And I'm like, I don't need to care. <laughs> I really don't. It's a great story, right? So, and and there's still a lot she got right. Yeah, I I'm I'm curious, uh, you know. Obviously, there's a ton of research that goes into what you guys do, a little bit more than pretty much any other genre. But also, how much responsibility do you feel to, to be authentic? You personally, not just to the reader, but to yourself, do you feel like there is a sense of responsibility that you have personally to be authentic and delve as deep as you can into what you're trying to do? I mean, obviously, you're not going to find everything you need to know about that time period, but but you know you could find quite a bit nowadays so is is that something that you guys take very seriously is it something you look at uh, being very responsible i think as long as the authenticity feeds the story and you do enough authenticity to get the people in the right place at the right time with the right context that's as good as you're going to be able to get it especially um in terms of those broad stories i i can't do those broad stories. I, I've tried and they failed miserably. Uh, so I do very short, very narrow focus stories because it allows that authenticity to be far more real. If if I tried to do the broad story, I just get so hung up on everything going on and I, I would never achieve anything. I'd never be able to get it out. And so I think there has to be that balance between doing the story and then shipping it. And if you get so hung up on the details of, am I going to get everything right? you will never get your story published. That, that's a great point. And um, it is important. The details are important, but as you said, focus on the big picture, focus on the story. You can always fill in details later. You know, you can you can focus on the story in the first draft and then figure out where details are appropriate, especially if the story just happens. To, there's a difference between a story that happens to take place in a different time period and a story that counts on something in a different time period. So if you're like counting on the Civil War, then yeah, you have to do a ton of research and make sure that as much as you can get right is right, especially because that's a huge you know event that a lot of people know the details of it. But one thing to keep in mind is that there are conflicting details out there. There's conflicting research on things like even for the Victorian era, which is my time period, about like when women typically married by there. There's conflicting research all over the place, and it's really tricky to get get it right. So you know sometimes you have to cut your losses and sort of figure out either how much of the research agrees, and I'm going to go with that. Or, you know, am I going to take a liberty here and say, all right, a percentage of it agrees. This is how my story needs to work. You know, I try to go with the biggest percentage, which has really screwed with my story sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes it a bit difficult, but it, it is worth it in the end if you can, if you are able to work that out. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, yeah, especially when you're dealing with um, cultures that are difficult to find research on. And sometimes, okay, so so here's a choice that I made once. Um, uh, the series that I uh, am working on, one of the characters was raised in Cornwall in England. Originally, I was going to have that character raised in Portugal. And I did a ton of research into Portugal and um, couldn't find enough about the daily life of peasants at that time period to feel like I could actually do it justice. So I switched it to 
an England backstory um, because I didn't have to do as much research. I've been w yeah. growing up watching period pieces in England my whole life. And so I already had a general sense. And so I had to do research still, but it was, it, it finally allowed me to actually write a story instead of just sitting there going, I don't know what, you know, <laughs> I, don't even know what so I think we have to find a balance. We Probably we all write historical because we really love research. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to um, strike a balance between just getting sucked into research and just learning stuff all the time and actually getting a story out there, whether it's 100% authentic or not. You just do the best you can. And I always strive to, because I portray a lot of um, minorities and marginalized people, I just try to do it sympathetically. Even if mm -hmm. I'm wrong, at least it was sympathetic. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's really helpful is to accept, I'm not going to be right. And just know I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to push it a little farther just to get as much as I can get in there. And there's going to be somebody that looks at it and says, no, this is wrong. And you know what? Fine. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to win that every time, but I'll do the best I can. There, there are sometimes um, things that are harder to find than a reader might think, or even a, a fellow researcher. You know, it's harder to find details on American Victorian era than England. England's everywhere, and you have to be super, super careful that when you're doing your research, you're not accidentally using facts from England um, instead of America. Because I mean, we have Google, yeah, and that's great, and um, doing research through the internet is great, but there is there are a lot of files that aren't actually there. You know, there are a lot of files that are still not scanned, that are just like in the depths of a basement somewhere. And yeah. unless you go there, it can be harder to find these things than you think. So, you know, we rely on what we have access to. Some people can travel to, you know, the Library of Congress. Some people can travel to, you know, a, a, the place where their research has been done and really look into those details. And some people, can't you know or it's not that's not the most important part so you know it, the research can be a little bit more difficult than it might seem mm -hmm. i'm curious Talina, you brought up an interesting point that i, I want to explore a little bit which is uh you found your love of of that certain era to help you propel you into a story and i'm wondering is that how you all discovered where you wanted to write in the history you want to write was it the love for that era that that ultimately is the reason why you chose to write in the historical context you're writing in. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna have to change, correct that a little bit. Okay. Um, I ended up I ended up choosing 1799 because the original story I had in my head was actually set late in the Victorian era. Uh, it was around like 17, sorry 18 1892, and then I started working out backstory for one of my characters and I got really interested in her mother's story. So then I s did a re bunch of research for around like 1849 and tons of research for this other story. And then I got interested in that character's backstory and that. <laughs> <laughs> and See where this is going. <laughs> and so now the story I'm writing now, it has totally kiboshed all those future generation stories. I may end up putting those into just a different format in another novel, but I really enjoyed doing the research on all those time periods and places that I had. The cool thing about what you do is it's fantasy too. So you have all this world to build around it and you could go back and forth and go into those time periods all you want. So you got, you got plenty of time to play with all of those time periods. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you bring it up that way because I, I sort of did something similar as I started with World War II, uh, which most um, people who are into military history and fiction just somehow start with World War II for some reason. Uh, but then every time I looked at something, I wanted to go back and be the interwar period and then World War I and then the, the beginning of U.S. imperialism and the Spanish-American War. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh God, this is going to go on forever. So I, I basically put a line at 1898. Like I'm not going earlier than that. And I, unfortunately, on the flip side of it, have to keep drawing it forward. So every time I look at World War II and I'm looking at the repercussions, I keep going, okay, well, Korea and then Vietnam and then now the Gulf War and then, you know, American invasion of Iraq the second time. It's like, oh, my gosh, it, I have to put a line on it on this end, too, and say, okay, today. And so now, like, okay, it's about 120 years. And that's the period I can operate in. Nothing else, at least in this time of my life. Maybe another time I'll choose a different period, but like this is the area in which I can operate now. 
Hmm. Yeah, it, it is really easy to get stuck into that. <laughs> I know for sure. Actually, in my interest, you, I have, um, I found at auction some um, World War II letters between a husband and wife, mm -hmm. and you, you probably have read that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, and it's I love that stuff. Yeah. It really yeah. gives the authenticity because you know so many times they thought it was going to end, you know, way earlier than it yeah. actually did, and it's yeah, that's a totally fascinating time period. <laughs> um, the way I got into mine was um, actually initially I had I've told this story a lot of times, but um, my mom would take me when I was younger to auctions, and I was really not into it when I was younger. But she, you know, there were these gorgeous like Victorian you know jewelry that she would show me and she would kind of explain like morning jewelry and things like that to me and I started to gradually become interested in it and think it was really gorgeous and just the whole idea of morning jewelry interested me and um and then there were you know all those period dramas like Telena was saying all these period dramas that I would watch that were just not only gorgeous but they had such different complications because of the time period and I found myself really wanting to write about the time period but not necessarily in the happy like everything is great way <laughs> that uh, we often see in these period dramas and not necessarily always the the beauty so I wanted to do the darker side of that because it was something that I felt was missing like even you know when you watch Downton Abbey there's the downstairs and you see the servants and their life is hard but you know, they happen to live in a household with a very, very nice, you know, person, you know, that they're working for and things are not as hard as they could have been. And at times I sort of wish we could have seen the extreme side of that, which is so much more difficult. So, you know, my books don't necessarily deal with ser servants too much yet at this point, but I did really want to just look at that darker side. And I already had some research behind me from my experience with my mom. And then um, I started just getting a lot more into it. And it, it was very interesting. This is one of the more scrutinized genres out there. This is one of those that really people have a, a passion for whatever period you're writing in. It doesn't matter. But there's somebody out there that has some passion. You know, even if it's BC, there's somebody who loves BC <laughs> out there. You know, oh, the dinosaurs. You don't know anything about the dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. There's always somebody out there. And I'm kind of curious. Uh, you, you guys mentioned that, you know, it doesn't matter because sto story is king and, and you, you kind of deflect all that anyway. But I'm curious, what do you feel like is the biggest misconception about what you write and when you write um, uh, the period that you write in that, that you found that that's, you know, either people don't know about or you really feel like I, I, I need to tell uh, people about I, I think there's a couple of things. One is that it was inevitable that the Allies would win World War II. And on the flip side, that uh, it was a good thing that the Allies won World War I. And so I want to challenge those assumptions because they are utterly not true. And that I, I think even a bigger one is that they were two separate events. It was actually one thing with a pause. And so I, I want to demonstrate that to people in a way that shows them, oh, my gosh, they just took a break so they could have another generation of people to kill. And they didn't solve what they were fighting for the first time. For me, I would say um, there's a, a lot of historical fiction in the Victorian era um, deals with, first of all, upper classes and a lot less middle classes and lower. Um, but even so, no matter what time period they deal with, a lot of times you see, um, which is inspiring and it's great, um, women like, you know, breaking out of the mold and, you know, um, doing things that typically they weren't allowed to do. And a lot of times they have families that will allow them to do that or in some way are more progressive or something like that. And um, that wasn't the case a lot of the time. Um, they also don't deal a lot with typical problems that happen up to this day and as far back as we can remember, like things like abuse, you know, and cults and things like that. You know, we really look at the most beautiful side of life most of the time and um, a very small percentage of people who were able to, you know, break free of the mold. But I like to deal with um, how life really was a little bit more. And I'm not saying I necessarily show all the dirt because it's a lot dirty, dirtier back then than they show in a lot of those dramas. They show it as very clean and it, and it really wasn't um, 
I won't even get into what doctors did to people back then, but it's, uh, it's horrific. You know, so I, I definitely like to deal with those women who were held down, who, who had it like a typical situation where they couldn't really leave their family until they were married. But what if they weren't really marriageable? You know, it, it's very difficult. And that happened in middle class families. It happened in lower class. It happened in all the classes. And what about those who have gone through abuse and deal with seriously difficult family situations or no family or anything? You know, a lot of times we have like an ideal um, view of, you know, these orphans who have a free life and just go do what they want. But it's not so simple. There's a lot of abuse in those situations too. So I do like, like I said before, I like to deal with the darker side of these things. And I definitely like to dispel some of those illusions that we have. Well, because I'm, I'm writing young adult and I'm, and it is a fantasy. So I'm actually trying to somewhat address modern day issues with what I'm portraying back then. Um, and I, and a good chunk of my story is set in a fantasy world like on our earth, but it's like a, its own separate island. Um, but uh, as far as some of the things that I have researched that I, I found it surprising, first of all, um, with when I researched the Roma, uh, I didn't know, like, for instance, in, I think it's in, I think it's in England, uh, the word gypsy is actually considered derogatory now. Um, kind of like uh, we wouldn't call First Nations people Indians here anymore. Um, so you wouldn't, and, and and just how how marginalized and persecuted they have been throughout their history. So that was really interesting to me and to see because I'm 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 researching them in their pre Vardo days. You know we think of them now as the colorful wagons and all that, and they didn't have those when I was when I'm doing my research. And it's actually pretty hard to find a lot of information about them back then because nobody had really taken an in, interest in them because they were like the vermin of society and the educated people didn't want to. It, I mean, I'm saying that tongue in cheek. They weren't the remnants of, of society, but that's how they were portrayed by people with the education who could have written about them. Mm -hmm. So nobody did. Um, and they didn't have their own, like they weren't educated enough to write their own stories. It was all verbal. So a lot of what we have for them is is handed down uh, verbally. And then now in later generations, there have been educated Roma who have who have tried to write down the stories like their grandparents have 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 told them and things like that. Um, the other thing that I found surprising has to do with the Atlantic slave trade, um, especially with all the racial tensions and things that are happening in North America, especially right now. Um, it's very easy for us to think that the white Europeans were uh, completely responsible for everything that happened there. And, and I'm not negating the responsibility of that. I mean, that's 400 years of badness, but Actually, the things that surprised me was, first of all, it was it was Portugal that started the slave trade and they didn't see uh, black Africans as less than themselves, um, whereas white Europeans eventually did. Uh, so on Portuguese slave trip, they were treated a little better. Um, they just saw them as somebody who with an unfortunate part in life that what, there wasn't a lot of racism, as, as far as I know, especially earlier in the trade. Put that in a YA setting has got to be such a challenge. Yeah, wow. Crazy. <laughs> Some of the things that I find oftentimes with doing research and and putting something historical or factual into what I'm trying to do is I have a hard time, you know, navigating that because I find something so interesting or so cool that I want to put it in there, but it doesn't fit the story at all. Yeah. And, and it's like, so it's like I have this great nugget of truth that that would like blow people away or you know would be so cool to tell somebody about but it wouldn't work with my story. Is that the hard part of historical fiction is is determining what is actually truth that you're going to tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely an easy answer. Yes. <laughs> so what do you think revisiting history in a fictional setting does for people today? What do you think it, what benefit do you think it has for people today? I think I've probably learned to love history because of historical fiction, because it, um, it brings it to life. And, and that's a very poignant example. Um, I'm a Christian and I was raised in the Christian church. And so of course I've heard stories about Jesus and Bible stories my entire life, but it's not until I re read a fictionalized version of Esther, when I was uh, younger, that that character 
just really came to life for me. And she's been a character that I've loved my whole life. And actually, um, I've co-written a musical about her and, and done a lot of research into her. And I'm just fascinated by that time period. And then uh, to add on to that, then a few years ago, I read Anne Rice's fictionalization of the life of Jesus and learned a ton about Jewish culture at that time that I would never have learned if I had never read a fictionalized version probably i wouldn't have gone and done that research myself and so i think that anytime we're interested in a time period um it goes from being just black and white letters on a page of facts to these people were real they were real life characters who lived in a real time period and had real problems just like me history is so poorly taught mm -hmm. that so many people names dates events oh god how boring but if you make it, just as Talina was saying, about the people, about their experiences in this time, about what was going on in their lives and how they approached that, then it's super powerful. And I wanna just give you a very brief quote of somebody that just wrote me and said, you are the first person ever who has been interesting enough to hold my attention and excite my listening or watching anything in the world of war. And that to me, says I'm doing the right thing. I'm teaching history in a way that people can connect to it. That's amazing. What a That's quote. super important. And you're right that um, history is taught in such a boring way. I often wish we could learn about history in terms of what we should be learning for our own lives, you know, the mistakes maybe that were made in the past that we can apply to ourselves. And I know we're very young when we learn this stuff and it, it, we don't understand it in the same way as we do as adults, but it would be a lot more interesting <laughs> and helpful, <laughs> I think. But um, yeah, with with mine, um, along the same lines, I, I one of the things I want to show is that, um, I think I said this before, um, things have always been the same. The same problems existed a long time ago in terms of psychology and personal issues and things like that. And one of the things I like to kind of show people is that they're not alone. And mm -hmm. You know, I've found in so many books that um, everything turns out fine or everything everything resolves in one way or another. And sometimes that's a lot of times that's not the case in real life. And I think it's very frustrating to read nothing that really is realistic. You know, I think in psychological thrillers, you more often find negative endings and things like that. But um it's not necessarily about being negative. It's more about looking at something and saying, hey, this is more realistic. Okay, I can relate to this. And I've had people um, message me and say, I really related to um, specifically Anatomy of a Darkened Heart, the main character and what she went through and reading you know, her story of abuse and everything really brought me back to what I experienced as well. And it's sort of, in some, for some people it's a release, for some people it's like a, a reminder that they're not alone or just that like uh, there are more ways of, you can leave something like that easier now. There weren't very many options for women or people in general back then, but now you have Facebook groups, you have therapists, you have all kinds of stuff that can help. And I'm not saying it's easy, it's never easy, but, um, it, it's very different to see a situation where there's no escape. So um, that that is one of my goals. And I've seen that in some cases I've you know accomplished it with some people and that makes me really, really happy. That it sounds like what we've all brought up is one of the most surprising elements is the human story that comes out of all of what it is we're writing in the history. And um, that to me is actually the most compelling as well is that this is all about people. Everything that we write in all of our stories is about people interacting with their environment and with events that are going on around them and uh, their own personal experience through that. And that is what I believe makes historical fiction compelling and because there's this emotional connection you can have with the narrator, with the main antagonist and, and with the story itself. It's true. And there are a lot of the same problems, you know, psychological, I like to deal with psychological <laughs> stuff and there's a lot of the same, it wasn't called PTSD then, right? But yeah, it existed. It there. <laughs> so, you know, and how did they deal with it? A lot, not in a good way. And, you know, so to your point, exactly. There are a lot of things that are threads through, you know, earth <laughs> that just yeah. are everywhere. And it's fascinating to see how they're dealt with in different time periods. Definitely. Yeah. And we often get lost in the in the strategy or in the, the contemporary time or what's going on, you know, at a big level. And we lose sight of the fact that it's these individuals going through their lives and what's going on in those lives is what's of value. 
And if we could capture that and we can relate that to the reader, to those who are experiencing it in whatever format they're experiencing it now, that's where the power of historical fiction comes in. I find it very funny that you all have tabs in your books, which means that you are historical researchers. You know, you're <laughs> you're taking that. I know exactly why they're there, but it's just it's so funny that they're that all, all of you had that. <laughs>